Hi, Thank you. Um, why are we here? Well, I'm here to give back because when I was younger and more or less brainlesser, I got a lot of help from a lot of people that I didn't necessarily know. And they didn't know me and I had no call to give me help. And they did. Um, I have a fantastic life, fantastic life. I had, I was, my first problem in life was that I was super smart. Um, when you're super smart in the 60s and 70s at school in Northern Ireland, well, start off, I started school in Southern Ireland. So my first three months of school was in a place called Rusturk in Mayo. And me and my brother were the wee feeding boys from up north with the fun accents. And it was an Irish speaking school. And we couldn't speak Irish because we were born in the north and we were brought to Mayo when I was four and a bit. So I started school in an Irish school. So I went through life not particularly like at school and a really bad start. And we learned to fight very small, we were wee totally boys, and we learned to fight. And eventually, we got home. My father was nearly killed in a road accident. And we were supposed to move to Mayo. We got a house, my mother got a house left her, and we were moving to Mayo to go down. But in the actual journey, the trip to Mayo, my father had a car accident in which two neighbour girls were fatally killed. severely injured. It was a terrible thing at the time. And that whole thing fell through, and my mother left. I remember looking up at the radio in the wee cottage, and I heard on the radio my father's name and call out and about the people being killed. I remember hearing it, I remember seeing it, I remember my mother dropping the dishes, and it's like something you see in a film when you're older. And she left, she just left, she just went through the door, and she was away for so, so long, so, so long. And eventually she came back, and Granny looked after us, Nanny is really lovely to call her. Nanny looked after us, she should come back. And when she came back, we moved back up to the north. And I remember my father with all the bandages, and he had he was stopped around with sticky bandages. His ribs were all broken. He had stitches in his head, and he was all he was all okay. Terrible thing. But anyway, we then had to start school again in the local school, which is in the north. And then we were the wee so and sos from the south. <laughs> so we were, we were square pegs around holding this and sack and go at it. But the only thing was, we had three months of practice. And Granda, God rest him, was a cobbler. And he, we got boots for going to school, and he actually put heels and tips on our boots, which was the steel thing she would get. <laughs> so the first day that I was at, sec at primary school in 1965 in Bali and they faked it on, and there was three guys, I'll never forget them. I'm good friends with them in later life, but the, their nickname was the horse, the hen, and the beano. And, the fight got up with me and the brother, he was about eight, so he could handle himself. And he was going on nicely, but he was outnumbered. And all I could do was attack the horse, who was small, when he was right bigger than me. And I grabbed him, and whenever I grabbed him, he stood up, and my feet came off the ground. But I wheeled the lining out of his shins and left him bleeding, and I beat him. At first year, first day of school, and the bully was beaten by a toddler. So I don't worry about it, primary school from kids. A lot of bother from teachers, a serious lot of bother from teachers. Looking back now, I had one teacher who was fantastic who'd learned me an awful, awful, awful lot. I went to her wake when she died recently, a couple of years ago. She was a fantastic woman. But the headmaster in the school couldn't accept that I was clever, so I was a smart ass. But I wasn't really, I just was smarter than him. And he didn't like it. And he used to play drafts with the pupils and anybody that that he beat them, he'd give them a sweep, but he could never beat me. I could always beat him in drafts. And he never figured it out in the seven years was a finish. He never figured out how to beat him. And the only reason to beat him was a copy of his game. So if he'd done a move, I would mirror it, so he was beating himself, and he didn't realise it. I left school, went to secondary school, and there was 200 people in a room, big, big room, I guess, and we'd done a test. And you had to do a test to discern which class you get in A, B, C, or D, C. So it meant you were like sitting at the smart table or the thick table. And I remember coming out of that test with the first, it was the first person called out of the hat with a hundred out of a hundred and I was picked for an A class. The first three years of secondary school was first, second or third in every subject. 
that was at in the school in the summer tests and in the Christmas tests. And in fourth year, I was either last, second last, or out of the class. And what went wrong? I matured, I found out alcohol and I found out girls and I found out smoking. And I also gave up on the teachers because they were thick. Not to be disrespectful to them. But when somebody would write something on the board and then read it out to me, I had it read before he had it wrote. I was doing the calculations before he was finished. I was calling out answers. So then I was accused of all the time of being cheating and being a smart ass and oh, you always have to have a smart answer. But I wasn't, I was trying to really get on the programme, but it didn't work. So my time at school was what made me who I am today. I was very resentful of school. I was seriously resentful. I hated teachers. I still not that particularly fond of them. I'll have to work on it. So when people introduce themselves to me as a teacher, I find it so hard not to say you're yeah, yeah, a rascal. But I don't I can blame everybody in the sector because of one person's one person's use of or abuse of me, and that was wrong. But I was, I was fairly older when I found that all out. I'll get that in a wee minute. I started in business when I was 15 years of age when I left school. And I remember the day I left. Um, I wasn't chased, but I was told not to come back. And I knew, I remember going out to the gates of the school. And I looked in at the gates and I went and got there. <laughs> you left and asked me back. He says, you knocked me back. You knocked me back. I went back in there. And four years ago, I was back as guest of honour for the prize night. And I went up to the podium, ladies and gentlemen. And the last time I was in this room, I was asked not to come back. <laughs> I am um, effing back. <laughs> it didn't go down well with the parish priest or the school council, but I got a roar. I actually got a stand in the basement. I'm down there with the kids, and I do a lot of work with kids. So anyway, left school young, fell in love with the most beautiful girl in the school. Absolute stunner and blew it. <laughs> fell in love with the most beautiful teacher in the school. And that was a mistake for her and me. And I was asked to leave and didn't go back. But anyway, I started work very young. I left home when I was 15. Started work. At 18 years of age, I was married. I had my own house, my own wife. Kids were on the way. Remember the night I proposed to my girlfriend? I said, you're yeah, effing what? That's what it was the 70s. So anyway, we're still happily married today. Some 42, 3, 4, 44 years later. So I was a really go getter, really good at working on cars, working on engines, building rally cars, working on bodywork. Loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. It was fantastic. But I was no good at business. And I lost a lot of money. In 1983, I went bankrupt. I lost everything. And I was too stupid to even do the, the, do the dirt and, and do a proper liquidation. I'm an expert in that now. I don't have to do it, but I help other people too. <laughs> so I lost everything. I started driving a truck. Imagine driving a truck. Long distance, couldn't wait. Out, boom, boom. We got a house built in 1988, miraculously. And the night we moved into it, I started a generator on the street, showed my wife how to switch it off when she was going to bed and stepped in a lorry and left with a load of beef for Southampton. Times were tough, but that's what we had to do. I got out of that, and one day I was reading the paper, Sunday Times, never forget it, and there was an advertisement, Tony Robbins, how to live the perfect life, awake in the jam within 1999. 30 days money back guarantee. I saw some of that. I was read 30 days now of that book sent back. <laughs> so I ordered the book and I'm not being funny. The 1999 was hard to get and it was coming out of a telephone bill or a mortgage or something. It was, there, was no, there was no scarce money, there was no spare money in the 80s. Not really three crumb snatchers from a new house that wasn't finished. I got the book, the book arrived in the post, I come in from a day, I was working in a garage at home, I was doing work on cars, working on lorries and being happy, a good house, blah blah blah, but I was unfulfilled, unfulfilled, and I got the book, the postman came at 10 o'clock, I didn't have my tea, and I opened the book, and I read, started reading the book, started reading the book, 12 o'clock at night, my wife says, are you not going to your bed, why are you reading that all day, 
He went to the lights off in that garage out there and get to your bed. She got up the next morning and was still reading the book until about 10 or 11 o'clock it was finished. And I closed Tony Robbins' book, Awaken the Giant Within. And I said, that garage is finished. And I says, I'm not doing that anymore. And she says, well, if you're not doing that, what are you going to do? I says, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm not effing doing that. I says, that's enough of that. And there was a truck in the, there was a truck belonging to a very big haulage firm. I finished painting and I put it out and I rolled down the door. There was big chains on the door and I closed down the door. And she says, that's the finished, I'm not doing that anymore. I learned in the book that if you weren't doing what you love to do, you shouldn't be existing. And if you were working at what you love to do, you weren't working. I love what I do. I'm not working. I love what I do. I meet new people every day. I'm outside every day. I have the life of Riley. I see my family every day. My three daughters and my son work for me. Some of my grandchildren work for me. I see my family every week of my life. Every week of my life. And there's multi-millionaires and millionaires and there's all sorts of people. And they don't see them and they don't get on with them and they don't. I see my family every day of the week and every week of the year. I see my grandkids regular as hell. They start working with me. My grandson Connor started working the other day for the summer holidays, three pound fifty an hour. And I get out there and get your work done. <laughs> I don't give. I don't give. I don't give. I don't give them. I wouldn't give them a fiver for nothing. But I'll give them work. I give them opportunity and I give everything. So anyway. I've got a wee thing called a cognitive blank, which is funny, so every so often I'll stop and then I'll wander off somewhere. I got that one about a stroke, but I'll come back to that one too. <laughs> so, my business and my book, I was on five committees. I was chairman of the youth club. I was on the parish council. I was on the cerebral palsy fund. I was one of the founding members of the Body Bear Trust, if you ever heard of it, in Dunyan. Fantastic, fantastic uh, charity that helps people. That, 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 that are ill and taps and gets them taught and all that there done. So I resigned all of them positions and I closed my business down and I started doing what I'm doing today. I started an outdoor activity centre in 1989 and nobody knew what an outdoor or a multi activity centre was. Nobody knew what it was. I didn't even know what it was. But I knew it was going to be successful. It reminded me when I started when I was really wee. When I was down, when I was wee, whenever we first came to Valley Valley from Mayo, and my mother brought us to the chapel's first confirmation or something big on, and the Cardinal, Cardinal Conway was there, this big boy, about that height, and a hat on him and a dress and a big stick. And everybody was over to kiss me, and I saw this. So anyway, my mother was very devout and very religious and all the rest, so she walked over to speak to the Cardinal and to be a good Christian woman that she was. And the cardinal stooped away down, he looked at me, and he says, I was laughing at him, he says, what are you going to be when you grow up? And I was small then, I was small, so I thought it was an insult, because I thought he was giving me a jag because I was wee, not going to be an adult. I said, I'm going to be successful. And the, the teacher who I didn't like, and still don't like, said, <laughs> Excuse me, Your Eminence. He didn't understand the question. And the boy with the funny hat looked at him and says, Excuse me, Master, you didn't understand the answer. <laughs> and I never got that till I was about 40. I woke up one day and went, Holy fuck. <laughs> I didn't realize it. Too late. Uh, oblivious. So, anyway, starting my business. My business is reasonably successful. We've had over a million visitors from the start of it. We've won all sorts of awards, including an award that I don't tell anybody about. We won Britain's Best Business, but you can't win that. <laughs> we won we think. But massively successful business. Successful for me because of my family connections, because I'm doing what I'm doing, and I'm meeting lovely people. They just walk through the door. They just walk through the door. When I bought the business, when I bought the farm where the business is, the very first day I owned it, Three so cottage, we're in the sweeping brushes, sweeping out all the crap, getting all the weeds off the street. And there's a land rover that the race companies, the land rover sitting in the ditch. And the door knocks, we're taking a cup of tea, and the very first person that walked through the door was Pante Ericola. Pante Ericola was a world champion rally driver at the time, he was wrecking for the Ulster Rally. And he walked through the door and he sat down and spoke to me for an hour. This is a guy who you couldn't, you just, no! 
That's all you ever seen of him. You couldn't see, you didn't get it, you couldn't, there was no social media, there was no, you just, boom, that's it. You'd see him maybe three times in a rally, and he'd be going past you at 100 plus. He, nothing, you read a bit of magazines, a lot of sport and all these magazines. He was sitting having tea with me, sitting on a five gallon drum drinking tea out of a flask. And he told me what I was doing, what I was thinking of doing was fantastic and would really work. And he was opening a rally school and he was going to do that. He was going to teach people how to drive rally cars. I was going to teach people how to drive off road. So this will work with fantastic conversation. A really good omen. Since then, I've had breakfast with the Queen. I've had lunch with the President of America. I've had dinner with Charles Camilla and so on and so on and so on. How does this happen? Because I know what's going to happen. I, I attract this stuff. These people here, wonderful people. There's two people in this room today who are on my list of people that I have to meet in my lifetime. I haven't told them that yet, I thought I'd save it for the stage. But I've been wanting to talk to this guy since I was about 20. Me? Yeah. Really? And I've been looking for him, Kim, for five or six years. So I knew I would meet them, but I didn't think I would be sharing the stage with them, but I just knew I would meet them. And that's the way life works. It was... Dale Carnegie, yeah. that said, if you can see it in your mind, you will hold it in your hand, and there's nothing to her. Anyway, my business was really successful, and we were going really well to all steam. We were winning rings around us, we were winning every competition, we entered every thing we entered, we were winning. And then, just like that, boom, boom, out of nowhere, I woke up in Craig Avon Hospital in this pipes coming out of me and me gone and me out of here. I had a trip of a lifetime by the way. A trip of a massive stroke. And I was shipped off and everybody thought I was going to or was dead or I was going to die. And I was everything. I woke up. Not able to eat, not able to talk, not able to swallow, not able to just a zombie. And I was taken out of that and I got back and I had to start all over again. I had to start all over again. The month after my stroke I lay down and, and slept for probably a month. But eventually I got my power back and I started to build up and I got it back and I got it back. And I wouldn't accept that this was the end. I wouldn't accept it. And I started reading again. I started reading all sorts of books. And I read Awaken the Giant Within yet again. And I revisited all the stuff I'd done before and I started to get back and get back and get back and get back. And just to help the thing along, whenever I did get back and go back to my business, one of my uh, managers has had a, taken a wee detour and an accountancy guy in the company had taken a wee detour with some uh, finances and there was a wee hole in the finances so effectively I was gone and anyway they asked me to close the books and said that's too bad you're sick and you're not well and they've done you and blah 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 but I got past all that and unbelievably because of the things that happened when I was ill because of what happened with the accountancy, we ended up in going to court, getting a court case ready. And I had to go through seven years of my accounts, my diaries, my bank accounts, and my statements, and explain to the brand new accountant how this all happened. And I didn't realise it, and nobody could have realised it. I was actually doing regression therapy myself on my own. And if you ever have a stroke, and God forbid, I hope nobody ever does, do that, get your diaries out from 10 years ago and rebuild it all again it puts it all back on the hard drive. Now I do miss out on a few things and do jump about a wee bit, but life is good. What's the future? What's the future? The future for me is to continue doing what I'm doing, meeting new people and having people coming down. During lockdown, whenever COVID come and we were gone, we were wiped out, I says, what are we going to do? And I was walking around this yard one day and this guy came and he says, what are you at? I says, I'm walking around here like the FN Zoo, the Belfast Zoo, like the polar bear. I says, I don't know what to do. And just like that, just like that, I knew what I would do. And since lockdown until about six weeks ago, we have built and opened the world's first ethical zoo. It's completely mad. It's mad. <laughs> There's 82 animals, models, in their right environments. At the alligators in the pond, elephants standing up at them, blah, 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 blah. The surround sound on the 100 acres, total surround sound, you swear you're an Amazon. And then there's big, 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 big TVs as big as this here. 
And there's five TED buttons. Don't press the red button, and everybody presses the red button. And David Attenborough tells you all about the animals and all about the idiot that opened the zoo. I know it's not Africa, it was Taurus Lake, but Benny O'Hanlon had done all this. So I've got a new persona called Grandma Ben. Grandma Ben's ethical too. Grandma Ben. Grandma is one of the best words you can use on social media for children's products for trust. So that's what they use it for. Right. So you're welcome to come down and see that. That's the future for me because we meet wonderful people. I'll just finish with this. Remember going to the concert, or always tell us you aren't going to the concert for Snoop Dogg. <laughs> and Snoop Dogg come on the stage, he says, 5,000 people there, and he says, What's my name? <laughs> What's my name? <laughs> it's a, it's a fucking board. <laughs> It's a laughing six foot. You don't fucking know who you are. <laughs> anyway, my name is Benedict O'Hanlon. My mother, God, and goodness, grace, and rest her, named me after the church she was married in in London, Benedict. It wasn't a great name at primary school. <laughs> we shortened it up to Benny. So most of my school friends and most local people know me as Benny. HMRC, the banks, etc. know me as Benedict. <laughs> Lots of people that know me from youth know me as Benny. When my kids started working in the business, they all called me Ben. They weren't allowed to call me Dad at work. Don't call me Dad at work, I'm your boss at work. So call me Ben. So they call me Ben. So Benedict, Benny and Ben. But my really close friends call me Bo. The great Bo Diddley. <laughs> I can count down people on the two hands, and I hope that there's people in this room that will join that group. So, what are we here for? We're here for you, and I'm giving back, and I hope that you get something out of the night that will improve your life, make it better, make you better, and thanks Gary and Cole for coming here.